Well, good morning. Please take your Bibles with me, if you will, and turn to one of the minor prophets, Habakkuk. Nahum, Habakkuk, chapter 1. We have a Scofia Bible, that's 955. Uh, 955, but Habakkuk, chapter 1. Again, I want to thank you for inviting us to be here with you this morning to encourage uh, each other in our most precious faith and in the uh, our Savior Jesus Christ. Certainly is a joy to be able to open the Word of God and to share with us some things that uh, may be pertinent in our lives that Spirit can take and apply to our individual lives. And happy Father's Day to the fathers. I trust you'll have a, a blessed day today and a good time in our Savior Jesus Christ. Warm welcome to those listening online as well, and uh, trust that the Lord will meet you where you are. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse number 1 and 2, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou shalt, wilt not save. How dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance for spoiling of violence are before me and there are that rise, raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked and judgment shall never, doth never go forth for the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Now this was written many, many years ago, but is it not applicable to our day and the circumstance? That's because our God made this an amazing book which transcends time and the human nature never changes. It always goes downward. It always takes us to degradation and corruption. And that's what it, the burden here, you notice a, a good preacher and a good pastor is someone who does bury burden. They are very troubled and, and hurt within their heart when they see people going astray, when they see people going in a perverse way, when they see people choosing the flesh over the spirit. When they see people that refuse the message of salvation, that is what Habakkuk was able to like here in this passage. It was a burden on his heart. It would be like a parent who knows and watches children make a wrong decision. It is a burden on their heart. As a dad, if I see my kids making wrong decisions, it's not that I'm angry at them. It's not that I disown them. I feel like the the father in Luke chapter 15, I believe Brother Duran mentioned that this morning, how that he was there and when, he, when his son was a long way off, he ran and kissed him and hugged him and brought, he was so glad to see him come back in communion with the Lord. Not so much in communion with him, but in communion with the Lord and with his Savior. Because I'll tell you, if we are using our life and wasting it on, in this world and what it has to offer, it is a complete waste. It stays here. It's gone. It's done when we pass away. But God said we can invest in an eternal reward. Look and read through the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, and look at the faith chapter. And they got to a point where they actually got their eyes off this world, onto eternity, onto their Savior Jesus Christ, onto things that were worthwhile, and therefore they rejected the things of this life and invested in something to last for eternity. May the Lord encourage us together. I want to look this morning for the time that we have at two words here in verse number two. How long? How long? Let's pray together. Please pray with me this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we read this morning about a burden which Habakkuk had. Lord, I pray this morning that you would give us a burden in our hearts this morning for the lost. Lord, that you would give us a burden and an ache in our lives if there is something that is separating between us and our God. Tomorrow, this morning is a time when we can, apart from the world, just focus on the worship of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that he is a God that's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And if there's someone listening this morning, whether present or online, who's never been able to experience the joy of a new relationship with our Savior, the destination of heaven rather than hell, the relationship that is unimpeded by sin and our own corruption, or that today the reality 
would be theirs. That today they would accept Jesus Christ as Savior by repentance and faith and calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved. By ridding ourselves as Christians of the things that separate between us and our God, the things that separate between us and our brethren, that we would get them out of the way that today we might be able to enjoy that relationship and Lord might build a better, uh, a better acceptance, a better uh, time to meet with our Lord, to come not just so as by fire with nothing to offer, but having a life that's invested in eternal things and being able to hear those blessed words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of thy Lord. Lord, we thank thee this morning. It's not about works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. But Lord, would you save us from a, use, a, a worthless life? And may today we get a, our eyes fixed on our Savior, Jesus Christ. And may it be about him and him only. Encourage your people. Draw us to yourself in Jesus' name. Amen. Habakkuk here is a prophet about whom little is known. We don't see him much in the rest of the Bible. But he writes about his concern about the holiness of God that would be uplifted rather than that Israel would escape chastisement. It's Father's Day, and I'm sure you look at your children, you look at your family, and I'm sure that there was, would be a burden for those who have seen their children walking astray and wasting good time in their life. I'm sure there's a burden, and I'm sure that you as a dad would pray the same as I would, Lord, would you get that son or that daughter's attention today? Lord, would you do whatever, the, the most merciful thing in their life that would draw you, draw them to yourself again. That's the heart, that's the burden of Habakkuk here in this passage. As he's crying out to God that he would get Israel's attention, that he would rescue some of them for himself, that he would get them away from wasting it on this life vapor and use it for their Savior, Jesus Christ, and get some purpose back in their life again. He lives in the days of Josiah. He knows what revival looks like. You remember the great revival that took place in the days of, of Josiah in 2 Kings chapter 22. And he remembered the days when, when Josiah began to reign at the age of eight. He remembered how Josiah sought to do what was right. He remembered how that Josiah ded dedicated himself to repair the house of God. He remembers the exciting days when Hilkiah, the high priest, went into the house of God and he went into the back room and he dusted off and he stumbled over something and he, and he got down and picked it up and he opened it up and he came back to Josiah and he said, I have found the book. Hey, it's a great day when you realize that this is a love letter from God written to you personally. It's not something for the, for the preacher to have something to preach out of on Sunday morning. It's not something that your dad and mom should have so they can teach you Bible verses in your youth. It's something that God wrote as a love letter to every one of us in this life. He gave it to us in simple enough terms for us to understand, and it's the book of life. I want to tell you every time you open this book up and you get down before God and say, God, would you show me some great things out of your word? I don't care what it is. I just want to hear from you this morning. He is faithful, and he will do that for you. I got down in my hurry this morning, and, and I misjudged the time, so I, I got here only five minutes early here this morning, but I took some time to open the word of God, and I was, I was reading in Joshua. And you know, I, I thank the Lord that his word is alive. And I read how that God said he wanted to instruct them and show them the way to go. He wanted to give them the right way. And he said this, because you have not been this way heretofore. And that just got me that God said, you haven't been this way before. You know what? You have an open book before you this week. You have no idea what you're going to encounter this week. You don't know what is going to be in your path. You don't know what is going to happen to you in this sin-cursed earth. But in Christ, we know that he is the way, he's the truth, he's the life. In Job, he said, he knoweth the way that I take. And when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And I'm thankful that God knows the, every step of the way. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows the mistakes I'm going to make. He knows how I'm going to trip and fall along the way. 
He knows that I'm going to make some wrong decisions along the way. But I'll tell you what, that a righteous man is not one that never falls. He's a, he's a man who rises again. And the Lord picks him up, puts him on, a feet, on his feet, and sets him in the proper direction. I'd like to say this morning that a righteous man is a man who has learned how to humble himself and repent. We're all going to make mistakes. It's in, our, it's in and of our flesh. We looked at it in Sunday school a little bit this morning in Romans chapter 8. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them we're the called according to his purpose. Not that everything's good, but everything can work together for good. I'm going to make some mistakes this week, but you know what? Humility is the thing that's going to bring me back into relationship with God. again. I think the crowning sin in the word of God is our old pride. It's the thing that keeps you from God. I was talking to a man in, in our outreach, and he basically had done everything right. What was keeping him from God was his old pride. The Bible says only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Pride is going to keep you from God because you think you're good enough. Pride is going to keep the believer in his sin. Pride is going to keep you from admitting you're wrong. Pride is going to keep you from turning in a different direction. Pride is the crowning sin of mankind. You look back in the, in the early days before God even created the world. What was the thing that caused Satan to fall out of heaven? It was that old pride. And it's the thing that is keeping him from repenting today. Pride destroys. It interrupts that fellowship. And I'll tell you, when he got to the point here, Habakkuk got to the point where this burden was in his life, I'll tell you what, Josiah had learned something very important in his walk with Jehovah, and that was that you need to learn to humble yourself and repent. When he found that book, Hilkiah came in excitement and told the, told the, uh, the king that he had found it, and he remembered the impact that it had on Josiah's life. He remembered how the Josiah humbled himself. He remembered how he instituted it into the kingdom. He remembered how he led the people. He was exemplary, exemplary even as a king to take the vessels that were made for Baal out of the house of God and burn them. He got rid of the idolatrous priests and cleaned up on the abominations of the land and the abominable lifestyles. He remembered how he had reinstituted the Passover. I'll tell you what, Josiah took the book of God seriously. I hope it's serious stuff in your life and mine. I hope you don't open the word of God and say, okay, what is the bare minimum I have to do as a Christian and not, a, and not obtain the judgment of God? I hope as a Christian, you get at this book open in the morning and say, I wonder what God would have for me today. I wonder what special promise he'll have for me today. I wonder what would bring me more in conformity with the will of God and would make me better prepared to meet him if he would come today. Because I'll tell you, he might, he might come today. We might hear a trumpet before we leave this building. I was sharing with somebody before the service, he couldn't come too soon as far as I'm concerned, but I'm thankful that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And it may be that God has one more life to touch on Tuesday night outreach. He might have somebody that he's going to bring you in contact with this week that he need, He wants somebody to be lighted according to John chapter 1 verse 9. He is that light that lights every man that comes into the world. Thank God that he's given us an opportunity. Oh, you say, well, it's our responsibility to reach out to the lost. I would like to say it in a different light this morning. It is our privilege to be able to reach out to the lost. You don't have to. I am a firm believer in the fact that God said he would light every man that comes into the world. But I'll tell you what, if I am a usable vessel in his hand, he will use me, though I am so imperfect. And it is a privilege to be able to share God's word and God's light with others around us. But Habakkuk remembered those days. He remembered how the, the book of God had changed the kingdom of Israel. I, I have no doubt that Habakkuk sat under some pretty exciting revival meetings back in his day. As you think of his contemporaries that, that lived about the same time, maybe he went to a camp meeting and, and he saw... On Monday night, Nahum was preaching. And I'll tell you what, Nahum's big thing that he preached on was the vengeance of God. You sat down in your seat and you sat up and listened and there was no falling asleep when Nahum got up to preach because he preached on the vengeance of God and how we are all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. On Tuesday night, Zephaniah set them back in their seats as he preached on the impending judgment of God due to their sad moral state and captivity 
was imminent because they had walked away from God. On Wednesday night, Jeremiah got up to preach, and he was the, he's the weeping prophet. He brought them to tears as he, as he shared with them the things that God had said. And thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way? And Israel said, we're not going to walk therein. On Thursday night, Ezekiel, somewhat of a newcomer, was going to share with them the reason for their captivity, appointing them to a better day to come when God would rescue them again. But I'll tell you what, it was a sad thing that as we come to the book of Habakkuk here, that revival had passed and gone. And here's Habakkuk as the man of God standing up and saying, how long? I don't know about you, but as I look at the nation of Canada, and see how it has departed from the faith, and how it's departed from the Word of God, and how it is walking in such contradiction and perverseness. I wonder how long. And I, I would look to God and say, Lord, would you send revival back to us again? Would you revive your church? Would you revive your people? And this is the spirit of Habakkuk as he's looking to God and saying, Lord, would you make yourself real to us again? Paganism has returned to Israel. And God's wrath is imminent. And it was like he could almost not take it anymore. I encourage you this morning, pray for your pastor. You don't understand what burdens pastors often bear. You don't understand what they're going through. And I find out that I find, I'm not talking about this church, but I find oftentimes in churches, the pastor becomes the target of, of pointed things and negativism rather than a man who they realize is bearing quite a burden and he needs to be uplifted and he needs to be encouraged in the things of God and faithful people need to pray for him. That's where Habakkuk was. And he was imploring, interceding before God. He was crying here and asking God, how long? Because Israel is out of control. Jerusalem's a mess. I see sin spiraling us down to the judgment of God. Several come to, came to the Lord to ask the same question. If you look back through your Old Testament, and if you even key in the words in, a, in an app you might have on your phone or your tablet, how long, you're going to find that David came to God and asked the same question. You're going to find that Job asked God, that Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Daniel, and Zephaniah, this question is asked them 16 times in Psalms alone, three times in Psalms chapter 91, 94. We as the children of God join in asking this question as we watch our world spiraling downward in wickedness and multiplying wickedness is multiplying exponentially. I hope you're not okay with that. <laughs> I hope you're not okay with the direction the world's going. I hope you implore God and ask Him to intercede and to make Himself real. But as we ask the question, how long? I want you to look at a few passages with me. Because it seemed as though as Habakkuk was crying out to God, heaven was silent. God was not answering him. He wasn't getting any reply. It was as though they had offended the very God that Habakkuk served. Turn with me back to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16. The Sabbath was given to Israel here. Verse number 16, uh, verse number 28 of, of Exodus chapter 16. The Lord came and the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he hath given you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man out of his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. In this passage here we realize that the first person to ask that question was God himself. And he said, how long are you going to refuse my commandments? How long are you going to walk in perverseness? How long are you going to walk in sin and think it's okay? How long do you not realize that I am the God of judgment, the God that's going to hold you accountable? How long refuse you to keep my commandments and my laws? You know, we're living in a day of relativism in our country. We're throwing away all the absolutes and replacing them with tolerance. You know, there was a man who was out on door-to-door -door evangelism one time, and he went up, and he just was trying to get a conversation going. And, and so he knocked on one door, and he said, I'm just doing a survey. I'd just like to encourage you to, 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 to uh, converse with me here a few moments this morning. 
what is the problem in our nation anyway? And the man answered him, I think that there's two problems, and it's ignorance and apathy. And so the preacher said to him, how do you think we should deal with those two problems? And his reply was, I don't know, and I really don't care. <laughs> ignorance and apathy. And that's what I find as we, as we seek to evangelize the people in our nation where we have some, some great prosperity. They don't know and they don't care. But you know, I was, I was out uh, sharing, try, seeking to share the gospel with some people and along came this man. He looked like a bit of a down and outer and he was pushing his car along and I said, hey, there's a guy right there. <laughs> you know, sometimes we have to get to the point where we know we need something. There's something missing in our life. We're down and out. And, and I went over and I had a chance to share the gospel with him. And I hope that we're able to get our bus up and going again so that we can go and pick some people up for church again. Now, COVID kind of shut us down and probably you, did, you, you as well. But he said, you know what? My daughter needs to get into Sunday school. You don't have to find that very often. He said, you know what? If the bus came by, I'd probably jump on too. We need to get our bus going again back at charity. We need to, to get out there and, and reach some of the lost. But you know what? Apathy and ignorance is something that has taken over our nation. And we have become a, a place where it's just keep the handouts coming and we're all good. And the sad thing is that our nation is heading headlong toward hell. We need to reach out and be that difference. So God said, how long? How long? And so as we take this now and, and take it from the lost and apply it to the church, how long is the church very loosely holding the commandments of God? How long are we not taking God really seriously in our lives? So in Ephesians chapter 6, God says that the first thing we need is the armor of God. We need to have our loins girt about with truth. Truth is that thing that holds the armor all together. I said we're living in a day of relativism, but we as a church need to realize that God is the way, the truth, and the life. There is still right and wrong. There is still black and white. There is either right or wrong in life, okay? We live in a, a day of relativism where if he thinks it's okay, well, it's okay. Not as far as God's law is concerned, and he is the righteous judge. He's the one we're going to stand before someday. There is right and there is wrong. And if you study God's word, you will realize what right, what is right and what is wrong. And the spirit of God will bear witness with the word of God and share that with you. You need to, we need to realize that we cannot mess with truth and make it make wrong right. If we mess with truth, the whole armor gets loose and we walk away from truth and we're left with error. Walk away from God's word and you're left with your opinion and confusion. Walk away from the light and you're left with darkness. And so that's why I don't like so much reasoning with people. If, if I have an opportunity to witness with them, I'd like to share with them the word of God because it is truth. As far as opinions is concerned, their opinions, every bit as good as my opinion. But the word of God stands true. And he said, let God be true and every man a liar. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 3 tells us that God gave commandments that it may be well with thee. But the age-old mindset that began in the garden is that when conflict arises, God is the problem and we walk away from him. And God says this morning to his church, how long will you walk in rebellion against me? How long? When are you willing to, to figure out that I am your life? How, when are you going to figure out that you need to prepare to meet your God? When, how long are you going to walk in complacency and, and your comforts rather than in thus saith the Lord? I'd like to encourage, you know, the young people in our church back home that God gave us his law. God gave us his testimonies and his statutes in his word, not because he is the righteous judge that has the right to do that. And he is. But he said, I want to give you my laws and my commandments that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest live long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And my son, my oldest son, Richard, just bought his first motorbike. Okay. I didn't think it was a good idea. I told him there were other ways you could die, but he said it was a good idea. To, okay, so he, he, he's reached adulthood. He can do what he wants to, and I'm okay with that. But you know what? 
he's going to realize that the rules on, on the road are put there because so that it might be well with it. Okay. So that 100 kilometers on the highway was put there not to be restrictive, but for your well being. Okay. There was a man who didn't think it was that way. He was an unsaved man, tragically, but he came down the road just up, just about, I'm going to say, what, a quarter kilometer from our house. And he, th he didn't think he needed to do 70 in a 70 zone. He thought maybe 200 would be better on his motorbike. Somebody pulled in front of him and he went off into eternity, okay? He thought it was funner in life to just go and see how fast this bike would go down a back road. No, the rules of the road were put there for your well-being and everybody else around you, okay? That's why God gave us rules and commandments and statutes in the word of God, right? Stay within them and it's going to be for your benefit, both in this life and in the life to come. Turn with me, if you will, to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14, and I see your time is rushing away from us, so I think I will um, just go to this one and then we will um, wrap it up. No, Numbers chapter 14, verse number 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they will believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make thee of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. How long will they provoke me and disbelieve me? Um, time to time again, Israel provoked God. And in their blatant disregard of him and his words, I'll tell you what, that oftentimes you find that even in a church community, we oftentimes find ourselves straying away and going independent of God. I remember, you remember uh, probably the illustration of a man who was in a hurry one morning trying to go to his doctor's appointment. He pulled into the, he pulled into the uh, parking lot and he couldn't see any places that were going to get him close to the door. So he was driving around and he said, Lord, please, I need a place. I gotta, I'm going to be late for my doctor's appointment. Would you please get me a parking spot? And he drove around the next corner and he said, oh, Lord, don't worry. I just found one. Okay. That's how we live life. You know, we don't realize that somebody quoted Proverbs chapter, chapter 3, verse number 6, um, that we should in all our ways acknowledge him. Why? And he would direct our paths. We don't realize that in every aspect of life, we need God's guidance. Okay? I'm glad that God knows the way that we take. And when he's tried us, we shall come forth as gold. But you know what? There's a difference in life between being going on a guided path or stumbling and finding your way. It's the difference between a guy who decides he's going to find his way just because he has a, a sense of a good sense of direction or somebody getting into a map and going the proper direction. Okay. If you don't have God guiding along the way, there's going to be a lot of bumps in the road that God has to make up for in your life instead of listening to the voice of God. That's what God's saying here in this passage. Now, there are many other passages that we could turn to this morning where God said, how long? Joshua chapter 18, verse number three. How long are you slack to go in and possess the land? In uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. How long halt ye between, between two opinions? If God be God, then serve him. And if Baal, then serve him. Uh, Matthew chapter 17, 17. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Uh, Psalm 4, verse 2, how long turn my glory into shame, and how long will you love vanity? I think that God, we need to realize that God was very silent in this passage in connection with Habakkuk, because so many times, perhaps even just in the recorded Old Testament, perhaps seven times, God asked the same question, how long are you going to provoke me? How long are you going to disregard my commandments? How long are you going to refuse my voice? How long are you going to walk in rebellion against me? How long are you going to hum before you're going to humble yourself and pray? There was an old timer, I believe he's a preacher in Tennessee named Thomas Mosey Lister. And on cold winter evening, he was meditating on how easy he found it to stray from serving the Lord. He looked back on days when he felt closer and his life was 
real and his relationship was important and he focused on it and he, and he invested in it. And he's looking back to those days and he's saying something's changed in my life. And he got down and he, in front of the fire, got his pen out and he penned the words of the song that I sang as a special this morning. How long has it been? Just taken from this passage, how long? It just might be that God might get around to answering the question, how long? When we get around to answering his question, how long? This morning is a time when we have a chance to make our heart right with God. How long before it's important for the church to let God be God? How long before we get down before God and say, God, this is a book of love written to me. I'm going to let it change my life and make me a citizen of heaven as I am in reality and position. I, don't, I, I can't, couldn't overemphasize this morning how much God desires that relationship with you. I can't tell you how much, if you're an unsafe person this morning, how much God, the heart of God is aching to have you just call upon his name to be one of his. As a believer, there's something separating between you and your God. Take the time this morning to make it right with him that that relationship might be renewed, that the heart of God would be thrilled like the father who saw his son return from a riotous life in Luke chapter 15. Invest in that relationship. God gave us his commandments and statutes and judgment that it might be well with us and we might live well, long on the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the Spirit of God is not just this story. Christ coming to earth was not just a good tale that our parents told us when we were young. But Lord, we thank thee for our Savior Jesus Christ who came and gave his sinless life as a sacrifice for sin that we might be reconciled to God. Lord, bring the conviction of sin in our lives today. May it be taken out of the way that we might have that relationship with our Savior Jesus Christ. I pray that you would encourage your people, draw us to yourself, and may we see the love that comes in the Word of God as he personally would speak to our hearts and prepare us to meet him in eternity. Lord, you might come today. Help us to be ready and watching for that day. Encourage your people. Bless us as we dismiss. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you turn in your hymn books with me this morning to 546? 546. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Let's stand to sing the first verse only and remain standing for prayer. around here would love to talk with you if you were looking to talk to somebody this morning and uh, if you've never accepted christ don't leave without him today he's willing he's willing to reach out to you and draw you to himself heavenly father thank you for the time spent in thy house this morning pray that it will have brought glory to thy name pray that you would encourage us uh, protect us as we go lord and bring us back again this evening to fellowship again around thyself in jesus name. thank you you are dismissed